all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so we are going to continue our discussion about multiple sclerosis or ms from yesterday yesterday we had a high level overview plus a clinical aspects of it today we'll go over the pathophysiology i think it is a fascinating topic and you would you would um, enjoy the understanding of it and then we will do management next and the discussion today would help us understand how the management goes so with this let's start quick um, references so this is drbean.com all of these videos are now getting up on drbean.com here is the video library this is a reference to multiple sclerosis pathophysiology this is oligoclonal bands what are they and what do they mean somebody had asked that question yesterday i have all of these links in the description this is another uh, article on oligoclonal bands this is the brain tissue cells so we are i'm going to explain those cells today and we are going to talk about the damage that happens to them during ms but if you want to read more you can go and see it here if you don't like wikipedia you can read it from whichever book for neurology you like this is a very good book neuro neurobiology of brain disorders and this chapter on multiple sclerosis is amazing and i actually have that book it is an expensive book but it is a beautiful book uh, let me show you so here is this book neurobiology of brain disorders i love uh, cardiovascular system and uh, ner nervous system so i have these books and i love to have these books so beautiful book and then um, this is a discussion of the nervous system tissue cells and we would talk about them here today as well this is a discussion of what are pericytes so we'll talk about them today as well this is a study i'm going to leave this study up because we look and in, look into it again the study actually says that they tried hookworm in patients of multiple sclerosis and half of the patients who were infected with hookworms, they did not develop any new multiple sclerosis progression or any new lesions. So that's a very interesting study and I'll explain what did they find. So with this, the books, number one, Neurobiology of Brain Disorders, beautiful book. I think it's $160 or so, it's a, but it is a great book. And then, I love this book as well. This is Robin's, Robin and Cotran Pathology, ninth edition. And then I also have Rubin's Pathology as well. So all of these books, references are used. So let's start our discussion. Okay, so here is a discussion for pathophysiology. You have to keep an eye today on two kind of tissues to see to see the damage in there number one the blood brain barrier and the cat that is mewing that cat is actually Kyrie. Luffy is outside playing Kyrie is inside and she wants to go out as well but she doesn't have the vaccines and those things yet so she has to wait a little more so here is the blood brain barrier this blood brain barrier during an active attack of multiple sclerosis gets damaged gets inflamed so we have to understand what will happen to this barrier very quickly if you start from here this little cell is a blood cell this could be a white blood cell this could be a red blood cell the point is that here is blood this blood vessel around this this is a small blood vessel so there are endothelial cells that are making up the inner surface of the blood vessel the endothelial cells in the blood brain barrier they make tight junctions with each other. That means they are very closely packed with each other. And that allows them to stop any blood products to enter the nervous tissue, uh, system tissue. Because we cannot afford the products from the blood circulation to enter the nervous system um, tissue. So because of that, there is this tight junctions here. Secondly, Outside of the blood vessel, the endothelial cells, there is something called basement membrane. Basement membrane, you can think of that as a sheet 
inside of that sheet are the endothelial cell. Now, in, the, uh, in this sheet, the basement membrane, the wall of the blood vessel, there are also more cells which are called pericytes. So these cells here, these are the pericytes which are part of the blood-brain barrier. They are part of the basement membrane of a blood vessel. Then in the brain, there is an additional layer. So these green cells that you see here, so this is a green cell. This cell has a foot process, we say it. The foot process wraps around the blood vessels. So there is an extra wrapping. So what are we doing? We are sealing the blood vascular system away from the nervous system tissue. We are creating a sealed boundary between them. That means, why is this important? Number one, it is important to understand this is the structure of the blood-brain barrier because this structure is going to become compromised. Secondly, it is important to understand that during the multiple sclerosis, this structure is going to become damaged. And we have to see how does that become damaged. So to give you a hint right here before we go further, number one, these astrocytes, the green cells, they look like stars. That is why they're called astrocytes. These astrocytes will be damaged. Basement membrane will be damaged because of the T cell activity in this area. And endothelial cells will open up to cause vasodilatation as a result of the local cytokines that are produced by the inflammatory immune system cells and by the damaged nervous system tissue cells. The result of that would be that this blood-brain barrier is going to open up. And when it will open up, it would extravasate things in the nervous system tissue, plus it will be, there'll be inflammation here. So this is one structure. Next structure is the brain tissue itself. So in this diagram, this all is the brain tissue. This is a blood vessel. This blood vessel that we were seeing here, if we cut this blood vessel open and we look in the blood vessel, we would see the following. We'll see blood in here. And the walls are now made up of the, of the blood brain barrier. What are those things? So if you can see outside this green are these astrocytes. Then this blue is a basement membrane. Then inside the basement membrane are the pericytes. And then on the innermost side of the blood vessel is the endothelial cells. And then, of course, inside the cavity of the blood vessel is the blood and blood cells and proteins and everything. Now, on the brain side, there are many, many cells that are there. But I just want to make sure we only look at those that are of interest to us. The interest is that these will get damaged. So the most important cell that will get damaged is this cell oligodendrocyte. Oligodendrocyte are the cells that manufacture myelin sheath, which covers the exons of the neurons. So these yellow guys are the neurons. These are the functional tissue of the brain. These neurons have long branching filaments. These are called exons. From these filaments, the nerve signal goes out towards muscles and other parts of our body. Or there could be the nerve signal coming in if these are sensory nerves. These nerves are long and these are covered by myelin sheath to make sure that number one, the, there is isolation between the axons and number two, the nerve impulse travels faster because of the myelin sheath. We call it jumping type of travel. The cells that make up the myelin sheath in the brain or central nervous system, these are called the oligodendrocyte. When they make this myelin sheath that wraps around the axon, this myelin sheath is that there are proteins in this sheath that are the target of autoimmune disease, which makes multiple sclerosis. That is what we are going to see today. But just realize that this blue cell's foot, which is covering the axon, this thing is going to get damaged. And when we repeatedly damage the myelin, then the cell would die as well. 
when the cell would die, then the exon will become naked. When the exon would be naked, it will be injured again and again, and it would develop scars on it, and it might even get damaged and broken, and it will not function correctly. In this process, this little cell here, astrocyte, might get damaged as well, and that would give rise to scars. And then I made a tiny cell here, just one cell, to just complete the tissue cells here. This is ependymal cell. Ependymal cells are usually present only when the, where the boundaries of the brain tissue is facing the ventricles or the cavities of the brain. On those surfaces, these ependymal cells are present and they help with this cerebrospinal fluid production and movement. I just put that here for completion's sake. In addition to that, if you see this little cell over here, this cell is called microglia. Microglia are the monocytes of the brain. They are the macrophages of the brain. Brain contains its own immune system. Brain does not like anything from outside to come in and act as a soldier. This is just like they said in a country, we don't want army to take care of the peace in the country. It is police's job or other agencies, but not army. You can think of the brain tissue in the same way. That is the country. In the tissue, brain does not want T cells and macrophages and B cells from outside of the body, from outside of the brain. That means from the body, brain doesn't want those cells to come in. So then if you ask the brain that, hey, how would you protect yourself? Brain would say, I'll protect myself by having a strong blood-brain barrier. And number two, I'll have my own immune system cells. I will call them microglia. Of course, we called it, but let's say brain is calling them. So 90% of the immune system cell are macrophages in the brain, which are called microglia. Now, in the case of multiple sclerosis, not only we will see extensive damage here, you would also see that these foreigner cells, the B cells and the T cells from outside of the brain, will break through the blood-brain barrier, enter the brain, and when the blood-brain barrier will become healed again, these cells would just sit here and make their nests here and make secondary lymphoid tissue in the brain and start living there forever. And then they would wake up every so often and cause damage. This is like army barracks, that once the army came into the brain, those barracks are established and then the army never leaves from there. It just sits there and then it randomly wakes up and causes damage. We'll see how the damage occurs. But this is important to note that usually brain does not like to have B cell, T cell, other cells from outside, inside. But once this damage would occur, then they would start living here. Okay, so now let's see what is the target of the damage. And I explained it before. There are major basic proteins in the myelin sheath. Major basic proteins are present in, from other cells as well. So just simply in the myelin sheath, there are proteins. These proteins become a target of the immune system cells. So we'll... Once that starts destroying, getting destroyed, then of course the brain tissue gets damaged. Now, before we see what is the damage, let's see why is the damage. So one observation is that areas that have less sunlight, areas that have less sunlight, over there, there is more prevalence or incidence of multiple sclerosis. And there are two possible theories there. One theory is that sunlight, the ultraviolet part of the sunlight, ultraviolet rays, they number one, help improve the function of suppressor T cells. In multiple sclerosis, T regulatory cells or the suppressor cells whose job it is to tell the immune system not to attack our own tissue. 
those cells do not function correctly. So sunlight actually improves the function of regulatory cells. Hookworm, hookworm also improves the function of these cells. Then sunlight also reduces the function of the T cells that activate the remaining immune system. Those cool beans who have been here for a long time, you know that we go from naive T cell, then T helper one, then to cytotoxic T cell, or naive T cell becoming T helper two, and then activating plasma or B cells to make plasma cells, which will make antibodies, correct? These T cells, we don't want them to become active against our brain. Sunlight somehow reduces the number and activity of these T cells. That's also very interesting. So reduces the T helper activity. Sunlight also reduces those T cells, those T cells that attack our self cells. Normally, immune system is trained not to attack our own cells or it is trained not to attack self. But sometimes these cells forget to do that and they start attacking our cell. Sunlight, ultraviolet rays actually help reduce the activity of cells that damage our own body. Then we also know that sunlight helps make vitamin D. And vitamin D, it is very interesting for multiple sclerosis patients. Vitamin D is a natural inhibitor of the autoimmune mechanism in multiple sclerosis. And that mechanism we are seeing today. So sunlight is very important. That's one. Then there are some genetic factors. We talked about them briefly yesterday. Again, briefly today, the HLA, DR, and Q. These genes are responsible to make the major histocompatibility complex or the proteins on the immune system cell, those MHC2 proteins that are used to bind with the antigens. This gene is seen to be abnormal or has an abnormal allele in the patients of multiple sclerosis. That means there is a genetic propensity for someone to have multiple sclerosis. This is why if somebody has multiple sclerosis, there is a greater chance in their family to have more people with the multiple sclerosis. So there is a genetic predisposition. There is also a genetic predisposition of abnormal alleles with the interleukin-2 receptor formation and interleukin-7 receptor formation. And what does that mean? That means that immune system cells, B cells, they work with the interleukin-2. And we know that cytotoxic T cell, they work with interleukin-2. When these receptors are abnormal, these cells behave abnormally and become unnecessarily activated. So in summary, there is a genetic predisposition as well. Then infectious agents, viruses can trigger the immune system through molecular mimicry. And the result is our immune system incorrectly starts attacking us. So we have talked about molecular mimicry. In this, what happens is there is a pattern on the virus or bacteria or some foreign antigen. When our immune system looks at that pattern, it can become activated against that pathogen. And then that pattern might match some part of our own tissue as well. Just like with SARS-CoV-2, we are seeing molecular mimicry for the cardiac tissue. Or with the vaccines, we are seeing molecular mimicry with the cardiac tissue or with the platelet factor 4. So molecular mimicry can occur. So for MS, Epstein-Barr virus, 
rubella, measles, retrovirus, herpes virus, zoster virus, they all can trigger MS by causing molecular mimicry. Can SARS-CoV-2 or these vaccines do that too? This is something that is still being researched, but it may be that we have a new virus and a vaccine that might trigger this as well. It's not yet fully known. But the symptoms you can see, it is possible that the SARS-CoV-2 activates EBV. EBV in turn amplifies MS. Hormones. It is seen that testosterone men have that hormone more. It is protective against MS. On the other hand, women that have more estrogen, estrogen and less progesterone, they have an increased risk of multiple sclerosis. One more very important thing is that those folks who take linoleic acid, so these are um, plant-based oils or polyunsaturated fatty acids, they have much more protection against MS. The reason they think, so this is a theory, it is not proved, they think that because myelin sheath is made 70 to 80 percent of it is made up of linoleic acid, it is probably because of that that linoleic acid, number one, it provides the raw material to make more myelin sheath. Number two, they, they think it is protective against immune activation. How is it protective? That mechanism is not known. But those MS patients that take more linoleic acid in their food, and this would be, for example, nuts and the vegetable oils, they are better protected against MS compared to others. So that's also another interesting thing. Now, going back to the pathology itself. So now let's say here is a virus. The question is, how does it start? And it is so interesting. Uh, I think this today, I watched many videos. I read many articles. I went through many books. What I wanted to understand was, how will an attack start? And you would see when you would go through these books and videos and articles, everybody would simply say, there is an autoimmune trigger and the attack starts. And then everybody tells you that when the attack occurs, brain tissue or myelin sheet becomes damaged. Question was, how does the attack start? And so after reading a lots of books, I think you will like this, that this book here, this book, it actually wrote, let me see if I can quickly reach there. So here, so this is molecular mimicry. Look, how does it start? One hypothesis for this initiation, this is the only book I could find that actually talked about initiation. How does it start? One hypothesis for this initiation is the possible activation of autoreactive cells by cross-reactivity between self-antigen and foreign antigen agents, a phenomena known, known as molecular mimicry. So what are they saying? They're saying, I had to spend hours and hours today just to find this one important concept because other books had not handled it. What they're saying is, somehow our immune system outside of the brain tissue our immune system has to come across some antigen that has a pattern that matches with the myelin sheet. That has to occur. Once that happens, so that may be a virus, that may be some other environmental factor. And that may be a virus that arrives in a person who has a genetic predisposition for MS. So once that virus arrives, we all know from our whole one year long discussion that the pathogen will be picked up by a macrophage, macrophage will dismember it and break it down and present it on its surface. And then the, the T helper cells will attach, naive T helper cells will attach with that macrophage. 
bind with that antigen and start activation either through T helper 2 pathway or through T helper 1 pathway. This is what is happening here. Because we've discussed it many times, I just simplified it into one engagement here. Once these T helper cells become active, then what they do is they enter the brain. Now the question is, the second question, why will they enter the brain? Why will they breach the blood-brain barrier? So let's say I have Epstein-Barr virus. That Epstein-Barr virus is, let's say, in my throat. And so my immune system cells reacted to it. Why will they go run to the brain and start attacking there? It seems like it may be that the Epstein-Barr virus, either the antigen or the virus might enter the brain as well and cause some level of inflammation there too, which will then in turn cause inflammation of the blood-brain barrier. Our immune system cells do not enter a tissue without some damage happening there. They don't just willy-nilly go and start attacking tissues. There has to be something. So there was, let's say the virus was here or some antigens of the virus were there. The result was inside the brain, there was some mild, very minor inflammation. The result of that was that blood brain barrier became active to say, I want more immune system cells to come in. When that happens, these activated cells, T helper cells, and T regulatory cells and macrophages, immune system cell, will start entering the brain. They would cross the blood brain barrier. Why will they cross the blood brain barrier? The cell that is already inside is releasing chemokines, is releasing cytokines. So, see here, this is a cell that is inside and it has seen some antigen and it has started to release a lot of chemokine. Those chemokines are, for example, interleukin-2, interleukin-1, interleukin-8, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, uh, interferon alpha, interferon beta, and so on. Even RANTES as well. So when those cytokines are released, then the cells that are moving around in the blood, they will sense the cytokine plus the endothelial cells here of the blood-brain barrier. When these endothelial cells will see or sense the cytokines in the vicinity of the brain tissue, then these endothelial cells would offer these hooks. These are called cell adhesion molecules. So I had done this talk once before that on a um, Navy ship, you know, the ships that have uh, the aircraft carriers, when the aircraft is landing back on the ship, the ship is small. So they have those hooks and things to trap the aircraft and slow it down and stop it. Similarly, there are hooks that appear on the surface of endothelial cells. These are called cell adhesion molecules. These are ICAM1 and VCAM1. Intracellular adhesion molecules and vascular cell adhesion molecule. These molecules are like hooks and they would start binding to the immune system, helper cells, T helper cells, macrophages, monocytes, and they would trap them, they will stop them. Now what happens is these cells have to get in. How do they get in? They get in by two mechanisms. When they become attached here, they start drilling holes in the blood vessel. They drill hole through the endothelium, they drill hole in the basement membrane, and then they create holes in the structure to enter the tissue. That is where the blood-brain barrier inflammation would start. This is what a doctor observes in the MRI to see, is there an active blood-brain barrier inflammation? That means this is an acute attack. The cells that are inside are also creating cytokines that also would help drill holes in the blood-brain barrier. So now the blood-brain barrier has become leaky. It has gotten holes in it. And from those holes, the cells would now, immune system cells would enter this brain tissue. 
that would exacerbate the inflammation there. So now let's see what happens. So check this out, what cells have arrived. So this was a cell already there. Irregulatory cells have arrived through these holes. E helper two cells have arrived. E helper one cells have arrived. They can also arrive as naive T cells, naive helper T cells, and then become bound to the myelin sheath proteins and then get converted to two helper two or T helper one. The whole immune system mechanism is deployed. Brain is in trouble. The myelin sheath is in trouble. So T reg is there. T reg cells. Its job was to actually suppress the self-reacting cells to say, guys, don't damage our own tissue. But somehow these cells are here, but they cannot function correctly. In addition to that, macrophages are here. So the, those dangerous things whose job is to cause damage, they're all here. So check out the T helper 2 pathway. We know this one, the, the cell, naive T cell will bind to the myelin sheath. Myelin sheath, remember that is an oligodendrocyte. So oligodendrocyte and its feet are in trouble. The feet are making the myelin sheath. So the naive T cell will bind with the oligodendrocytes, myelin parts, the proteins there. Then if it becomes T helper two, then that would activate B cells. B cells will make antibodies. Now this is all happening inside the brain. These antibodies would then go and deposit on the myelin sheath because these antibodies are against the myelin sheath. We were not supposed to have cells to react against our own body. These are bad cells who have just been formed somewhere in our body and they have looked at some virus and have thought that they want to, they are seeing the same antigen in our brain tissue as well and they're attacking it. Now the antibodies are present here. Complement system will become activated and that would bind to the myelin sheath as well. The result is wherever there is an antibody, wherever there is complement, natural killer cell would start destroying that tissue. Macrophages would start destroying that tissue. In addition to that, if the system goes T helper one pathway, that will mean interleukin two will be released. Remember T helper two pathway would release interleukin four, five, six, 10. T helper one pathway would release interleukin two plus interferon gamma. That is T helper two pathway function cell, T helper two cells. When the interleukin two is released, that would activate the cytotoxic T cell. Cytotoxic T cell in turn will go and damage the myelin sheath. T helper two cell would also release interferon gamma. Interferon gamma would activate the macrophage and macrophage would start munching at the myelin sheath. So this is like dogs have come in and they're all just chewing and biting at the myelin sheath. And the, the cells that were supposed to calm the system down, those cells are not functioning correctly. So what is the result? Result is active inflammation. Now, in the beginning, if we now look at how these neurons they get damaged and how do they behave? What happens to them? So imagine this is one neuron. The very first time when this happens, this event occurs. Most of the time there is a spontaneous remyelination. So if you see in this diagram, there is a macrophage here, there is a CD8 cell here, there's a natural killer cell, there may be other antibodies and other things. The end result is this oligodendrocyte is being damaged. When that happens, it is possible that the myelin sheath damage that occur that would immediately be restored by OPCs. These are oligodendrocyte precursor cells. What are these? They are baby cells that are made from the stem cell. Why? Because our body, our brain tissue releases cytokines to say, I need more oligodendrocyte. My oligodendrocytes are being damaged. And so baby oligodendrocytes are formed, which are called OPCs. OPCs would come in and quickly create new myelin sheath, and that would cover the axon wherever the damage has occurred. 
and this is why the patient will feel almost 100% again although the damage never recovers fully but patient would feel almost 100% but repeat this process again and and fail the regulatory cells regulatory cells are not working they're not suppressing they are supposed to suppress then redo this process again and again and what would happen is that finally this oligodendrocyte that was here is dead with repeated injury and insult finally it dies when it is dead the axon has now multiple outcomes it is possible that the whole axon becomes naked lost the myelin sheath it is not functioning correctly it is not firing correctly the nerve impulse is not traveling with the right speed from it so it is not a good citizen of function anymore when everybody is running this is walking so that creates all those symptoms and signs that we discussed yesterday it is also possible that it gets wrapping of scar tissue the astrocytes that are present here these cells these cells the astrocytes astrocytes are very very important tissue cells they have a lots of function including the integrity of the blood brain barrier including they provide a structure in which the brain tissue is formed they create a shape of the brain tissue they also manage the calcium metabolism they also manage the potassium metabolism they also manage the neurotransmitters of the brain's metabolism they would eat up any extra calcium or potassium or neurotransmitters so they are very very important one more important thing that they do is they try to create the scar tissue in the brain so if the astrocytes are present they might help make some scar tissue eventually even the astrocytes are damaged and so that scar tissue that is formed appears as plaques in, in the M mri the worst thing that can happen to the neuron other than malfunctioning is that the neuron can actually break why would a neuron break because the attack is not on the neuron attack is on the myelin sheath the neuron can break because when the attack is occurring there is so many chemical substances that are released which are cytotoxic that the toxicity the irritation from those can cause the the cell to break so when it is broken there is a possibility that it would regenerate so neurologists who are listening they know that it is sometimes possible that these ends will move towards each other and they they would regenerate but not many times and they know that there will be a valerian degeneration and what that means is that this part the distal part this is like if my finger is removed it is cut my hand would stay healthy but the finger that is removed would die similarly this part of the axon that is removed will die it does not have nutrition coming to it anymore so this part might still live but this part would die that is called valerian degeneration so axons would start degenerating as well so that is the advanced stage of this disease and finally an important study which is interesting and that is that in as i mentioned in the beginning hookworm when present in people they had 71 patients they infected them with hookworm here and they said the results at the end of the trial showed that the total number of new mri lesions did not differ significantly between patients receiving hookworm and those receiving placebo however more than half the patients on hook, hookworm had no new lesions at all and their conjecture is that hookworm improves the function of t regulatory system cells so here is a hookworm that is kind of wrapped around a t regulatory suppressor cell and asking it to function better so this is the discussion um just a few points let's do them in the chit chat so that this video stays this size i want to make some more point about 
how does the immune system become so dysregulated? And when we come back on tomorrow, we'll do a Zoom call. When we come back on Monday, we'll talk about the management approaches and what are the therapies that are available, and we'll go from there. So, um, so thank you very much for the for your time for listening. Please like, subscribe, and share. And if you like this kind of work, this work, this uh, content, uh, you can support this. There are links in the description. One is to use PayPal. Other one is to buy me a coffee. Or you can become a patron as well. So thank you very much. And I would see you in a second in chit chat.